name is Chris Miller. I'm president of the Piedmont Environmental Council. Um, and very happy to have you all here. Very pleased to welcome Trevor Potter and hopefully uh, provide some great insights on what it takes to be a citizen in Virginia in 2021. One of the reasons we wanted to do this is that PEC members on the whole are very active in their community affairs. They participate in local, state, national policy debates across a wide range of topics from climate change to conservation to local development issues. We work hard as an organization to engage them and the general public around relevant topics, educating them on programs and policies available to respond to an issue, empowering them to act and helping them more effectively engage with policymakers. But over the last 20 years, the number of issues, the variety of policies and programs and the complexity of public participation has increased substantially. And just in the last 18 months, the emergency created by the COVID pandemic has public bodies meeting in constantly shifting combination of in-person and remote meetings with changing requirements on how citizens can observe and comment. During such a period, trust in public officials, especially elected officials, would be a blessing. But over the past decade, the process of elections alone has become increasingly complicated and hard to understand. In the Virginia, we're in the midst of a complex redistricting process, testing a recently enacted concept to reduce partisan gerrymandering of state and federal boundaries for 140 members of the General Assembly and Virginia's 11 con congressional districts. Over the past few years, Virginia has enacted new elections laws that have facilitated access to voter registration, absentee voting, and early voting. And we've witnessed an increasingly unusual procedures by which political parties select candidates, including the ranked voting process used to select this year's Republican candidate for governor. Over the past year, the nation has debated the integrity of elections that took place in 2020 with a flurry of changes to state elections law a high profile effort in Congress to ensure full participation. The, uh, the Lewis uh, the fair, fair elections uh, legislation that's being debated currently. Tonight, I hope we can, we can help our members <clears throat> make sense of all this activity, what to focus on in the ongoing debates and better understand how they can remain effective in civic engagement. So to help us with that, we've asked Trevor Potter to, to join in. Trevor is the founder and current president of the Campaign Legal Center. He's a former chairman of the Federal Elections Commission and was general counsel to John McCain's 2000 and 2008 presidential campaigns and an advisor to the drafters of the McCain-Feingold law. To many, he's perhaps best known for his recurring appearances on the Colbert Report as a lawyer for Stephen Colbert's super PAC during the 2012 election. Uh, the American Bar Associated Journal has described Potter as, quote, hands down one of the top lawyers in the country on the delicate intersection of politics, law, and money. He went to the University of Virginia. Uh, he's lectured there at the School of Law and, and at Oxford University. He served on the, as the chair of several American Bar Association election law and lobbying regulation committees and task force and he's currently a member of the ABA Standing Committee on Election Law, as well as American Law Institute. In recent years, Potter has led this, this campaign law center as legal center as it has grown to meet significant challenges to our democracy. In October 2017, lawyers for CLC argued Gill versus Whitford, the groundbreaking Supreme Court case seeking to end extreme partisan gerrymandering. CLC continues to play a leading watchdog role on ethics, providing expert analysis and helping journalists uncover ethical violations, and it participates in legal proceedings across the country to defend the right to vote and improve disclosure and regulation of campaign finance. Trevor, you bring an incredible range of experience and expertise to the discussion, both as a legal scholar and a practitioner in election law but also as an active member of our community and a strong supporter of conservation. We hope you can inspire us all to be better, and more effective citizens. Thank you, Chris. It's, it's great to be with you. That was a mouthful of an introduction, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm uh, glad to have a chance to have a conversation. This is, this is a, a really, I think, complicated, difficult time 
uh, for us as a country in the in the world of of uh, elections. Yeah. Well, again, we appreciate you taking the time to help us, and we're going to dive right in. Um, Virginia is one of two states, the others is New Jersey, with elections for state offices in 2021. In addition to the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, all 100 seats in the House of Delegates are on the ballot. Where does Virginia stand relative to the common assumption that citizens of the United States have an equal opportunity to participate in elections? The sort of the basic idea of one person, one vote. Where are we? Well, let's start with the fact that we're voting this year. It's a so-called odd year. Uh, there's only one other state that's electing its governor this year, New Jersey. Um, we as a country have more elections than I think any other democracy in the world. We vote for pretty much everything, uh, probably including dog catcher. Uh, and we vote through the year and in Virginia every year for one office or another. And that's, that's obviously uh, on, on the one hand, good to have a participatory representative democracy. On the other hand, it is a problem and the, there's a certain level of burnout uh, in terms of voters and people consuming information and people who are less informed say, wait a minute, didn't we just have the election? Why are we having another one? Um, the, the history of Virginia going to the off year was to decouple it from national uh, politics uh, and be able to focus on local issues rather than, than national ones. Um, but I think we're, we're very fortunate to be voting in Virginia uh, at this time because the state has done a very good job of organizing its elections. Uh, it uh, did rewrite its election laws in this last legislative session uh, to make it uh, less difficult to vote. Uh, it, the legislature did a number of things uh, in terms of providing for early voting, uh, providing for uh, voter ID uh, that was not so restrictive that people who don't have, for instance, a driver's license because you don't drive a car because you're, you've given up your, your car or you live in an urban center and you take the bus, people like that uh, had trouble sometimes voting under the old system. So Virginia still requires voter ID, but provides a whole range of ways to do that. Um, my organization, the Campaign Legal Center, actually did a survey nationwide of state election laws in terms of how easy it was for citizens to participate and vote. And Virginia came out at the, at the very top. It, it uh, had nine of 10 uh, positive uh, criteria. And there have been other surveys that have said that, that Virginia has been good at providing uh, access to the, the polling booth to its, its citizens. Uh, and as you noted, uh, in the middle of this election cycle, uh, Virginia now has its first independent uh, redistricting uh, commission, uh, independent of the legislature. And maybe it's worth for a moment just pausing on that because it was not an easy trip. As you noted, the Campaign Legal Center has been fighting gerrymandering around the country. We were the lawyers in the Wisconsin case you mentioned, then the uh, North Carolina case where we lost 5-4 in the Supreme Court. The issue in those cases is should incumbent legislatures be and the dominant party in those legislatures be the people who draw their own district lines for the next election. Because legislatures, at least every 10 years, draw the lines for their own seats and for congressional seats. And traditionally in this country, whichever party was in charge of that line drawing process uh, would draw lines that favored their team and made it harder uh, for the other side to elect members of Congress and members of the legislature. And when you have a situation where the legislature and the governor, who in most but not all states has to approve it, are of the same party, you often get what's called a, a gerrymander, uh, named after Governor Gary of Massachusetts, who drew a line with a quill pen uh, that, that looked like a salamander and very carefully favored his candidates. 
So today we don't use quill pens, we use computers uh, full of information. So they know pretty much what we all ate for breakfast. Uh, and they certainly know which party we're registered in, which primaries we voted in, when we voted, uh, all of that information. And so with the new technology, it is possible, and this is what we were fighting in North Carolina, to take a state that's basically 50-50 and turn it into a congressional delegation that was 10 Republicans and three Democrats. So really not representing the way the people in the state were voting. And if you look at other gerrymandered states, uh, Ohio is rather like that with a, a congressional delegation and Florida, much more Republican than the state votes. Illinois is the other way, has a, a Democratic governor and legislature and Republicans get maybe 45% of the vote and far fewer uh, members of Congress and of the legislature. So that's the battle. Virginia stepped into this uh, several years ago. We, we have a constitution that's quite hard to amend. Uh, that's sort of you know, the, the old fashioned former colonies, East Coast states uh, generally don't like a lot of change in their systems. And so they make it hard. Whereas if you go to the other side of the country, a group of citizens can put an initiative on the ballot, make law by themselves, change the constitution by themselves without any legislative involvement. Here, people have to, the legislature has to approve a ballot proposition in two consecutive sessions of the legislature. So the first time before it goes to the voters and then the voters have to approve it to change the constitution. So the first time there was a Republican majority in the legislature and the Democrats pretty much en masse and a couple of brave Republicans agreed to ask the voters if they wanted a independent commission to draw these lines. Then there was one of those elections and it turned out the Democrats took control even under the old lines and suddenly the shoe was on the other foot and when it came time to do the second vote on it, golly, many of the Democrats had changed their mind because they now controlled the legislature and the governorship. All of the Republicans were suddenly for it, uh, including all those who voted against it before, and a couple brave Democrats stepped forward. So we ended up with something that went to the voters, was approved last year, and it creates this independent commission, which has started its work. Now, in theory, I think independent commissions are better than having partisan legislatures do this. And that's how it ought to be across the country. Uh, that's not how it is. There are uh, fewer than half the states have some form of independent commissions. They're all different. Uh, California almost pulls the names out of the phone book of people to serve on it. Uh, Virginia uh, has a, a system where there are eight chosen by the legislature varied by house and party, uh, and then eight uh, chosen with citizen applications. Uh, so it's, it is less independent because it has eight members of the legislature involved in it. Uh, they have just uh, met, They've uh, each uh, party has a lawyer who has made recommendations to them of lines. So they're looking at those first ones. So one of the things that differs state by state is do you pay, do you tell the line drawers to pay attention to the current members of the legislature and where they live? And this group didn't do that. And the result is that they drew lines and the districts look a lot less peculiar. There are no salamanders in this. Um, they're much more cohesive, which is good for a community. You don't like communities being split, as you probably all know, the, uh, one of our current congressional seats goes almost from West Virginia to North Carolina. It's one of the longest districts in the country, uh, long and thin. And so it doesn't do that. But what it did do in, in these first maps is they didn't take into account where legislators live. And so they put districts together that have several Democrats living in the same district who would either have to run against each other or leave uh, and several Republicans in other districts. And so now the commission will look at this and probably say we want to redraw those lines so that we don't have as many incumbents running against each other. So there's that issue. There's the key issue of minority representation because the drawn maps that have were done so far did not have demographic data in the system. And one of the federal requirements 
is that when you're drawing lines, you cannot diminish existing minority representation. And one of the reasons that the Democratic Black Caucus opposed this process is they said, we're worried that they won't take sufficient account of our demographics and we might end up with fewer minority representatives than we have. And so that's another thing that this commission is going to have to grapple with in the, in the weeks ahead. But I, I still applaud Virginia for having taken the brave step of having an independent commission. I would note that CLC works around the country trying to get these on the ballot and approved. There has never been one that the voters have disapproved if it gets to the voters. It's the legislatures that don't like it, not the voters. So to be provocative, uh, one congressman suggested that we elect all the congressional representatives at large and, and not, not worry about where they live in, in, in a geographic representation. And in fact, in terms of our local elections, there are a number of jurisdictions which elect the local bodies, um, board of supervisors, city councils that way without reference to geography. Is that possible uh, under the, the constitution? So, you know, it's interesting when, when we first started having elections in this country, there were several states that decided in their first election that they would elect their members of Congress at large. Do you remember the legislatures elected the senators to start with and the people elected the members of Congress. And so some states did it that way. Um, they largely moved away from it. I think Illinois did some seats where there were two or three members uh, elected from a very big area of the state um, into the 20th century. One of the problems with that, uh, if you have a diverse state, is that the majority can then elect all the members of Congress. And if the minority is a racial minority, they will end up with no representatives of their community in Congress. And so uh, Congress actually passed a law, so it's not unconstitutional, but there's a federal law that says states can't elect members of Congress at large unless they always have, which means nobody. Uh, so they, you'd have to change that federal law. Uh, and I think the issue would be, how, I mean, this is the balance here. Uh, the, if you have lines that give you a specific community, then, you know, a black area will elect, uh, or has a better chance at least, a uh, better likelihood of electing uh, a black member of Congress, uh, a Hispanic area, um, a Hispanic member and so forth. And so if you had the whole country running at large, you would end up with, I think, a much less representative Congress. Uh, it's a funny subject to raise because, as you point out, there are still localities um, that do that or have a mix. There are some that are city councils that have some at-large seats and some representatives of specific districts. Uh, the city of Virginia Beach uh, had an interesting system, which they don't have anymore. Uh, and that was they had some residential districts, meaning that you had to reside in that district to run. And that was the majority of the council and then a couple at large. But the entire vote for those residential districts was at large. So the whole city voted for the specific representatives from specific districts. And um, Gosh, the effect of that turned out to be almost no minority representation on the city of Virginia Council. Uh, and Campaign Legal Center sued. We had a long drawn out court battle over that under the Federal Voting Rights Act, uh, saying that it meant that those communities in the city could not have their representation that they should have by law. And we actually won that uh, this spring. Uh, and it's the city is appealing it. But meanwhile, the state of Virginia changed the law uh, to say they're going to have to move to a form of uh, representation uh, in, in districts. So it's an evolving area, uh, not easy to do this, but I sympathize with the member of Congress who thought fighting over these lines and getting the numbers right. And of course, the Supreme Court told us in the 60s that the districts for Congress had to be pretty much the same size. And that's why when we have the census every 10 years, you have to move it all around and some states lose members. Uh, and then inside of a state, 
some populations, some areas have swelled and others shrunk, which is why you have this ongoing line drawing, trying to keep it with even populations. It seems like the, the, the structure of our laws, you know, which evolved in specific circumstances are now perhaps at odds with, with people's hopes and, and aspirations, even their expectations. You know, I think with a lot, uh, what I've observed in the, in the last few years is the assertion of a set of values or of ideas about basic functions of government around the rights to food and housing and education and expression and justice that aren't necessarily how we started out setting up government and the rights that we were trying to protect. So this evolution of how we, how we decide is important because the very notions of what government's for are, are also evolving. So it's, a, it's an interesting, sort of, it's a much more dynamic system than we think. The rules are always changing. Well, on the one hand, the, the US constitution as originally drafted it is really quite broad. I mean, the concept that the federal government was going to provide for the common welfare, um, it could be very expansive language. Uh, at the same time, you know, of course, we fought a civil war over the rights of individual states and whether there was such a thing as a sovereign state uh, as opposed to a federal union. So you have that. And then you have, as, as I think your question really indicates, that um, we just have a different conception of who we are as a country and a people than we did in 1789. Um, remember, they, they had only known life as subjects of a king uh, with, with central authority and whatever elections they had were at the sufferance of the monarch and legislatures were dissolved when they uh, were uh, critical of the royal governor or the king. So they were starting from scratch and they created a, uh, a republic. And that had very diffuse powers, all the famous you know, checks and balances. But also there was an assumption that normal people, A, weren't educated, which was true, where the majority of the country was illiterate, um, that they were not capable of self-government. And so the founders gave us this you know, odd system of senators appointed by legislatures presidents elected by the electoral college, which was the best and the brightest in every state uh, and, and not under the control uh, directly of the, even the legislatures and certainly not the people. There was no popular vote for president uh, and only the members of the house, the people's house were popularly elected by the people. And remember the people in 1789 by definition excluded starting with fully half the country because women were not people for those purposes. Uh, plus uh, at those times, the of course would have been uh, no enslaved person. Um, and then in many states, uh, you had to be a property owner to be a voter because that gave you a stake in the system. So even the people's house was a very small version of who the people are. And as I say, we fought civil wars over some of that uh, in, in terms of allowing all natural born Americans regarding of race, color, creed to vote. Um, we had a, gosh, 50 year battle for women's rights. Uh, then uh, it took the Vietnam War and the slogan, if you're old enough to die for your country, you're old enough to fight uh, to, to get us the 18 year old vote. So we have seen over and the whole civil rights movement to make sure that that uh, minority Americans actually had the rights the Constitution gave them after the Civil War. This, is, this has been um, maybe you could say an arc moving forward, but it's definitely been a battle in, in fits and starts. So we've ended up with what we now call um, a democracy or a democratic republic where citizens have and expect to have a much more direct role in government than our founders ever thought they would. And yet it, it gets, it's, you still feel a little disconnected. I think, I think the, one of the two areas that I want to dive into is how we choose the people that are on the ballot and, and the, the role of parties and not party nominations and, and the potential for independents to participate, how different states have dealt with that. And then secondly, how the, the, the state of parties affect local elections so that you don't even feel like you're in control of 
who you're voting for in your own community. You've had some direct experience with those in Virginia and, and you know, without, without getting into all the details, talk a little bit about the fairness of the ballot and the, the choices that are presented to the voters and how those nominees are picked. Um, so we have what we call a two party system. Um, other parties are welcome to form, but they are disadvantaged by law. Every once in a while, I get asked by somebody uh, why we don't have a third party or by somebody with a lot of money, whether uh, I think there's a route to a third party that they could finance. And, and my answer is, you know, the system is stacked against third and fourth parties because you have to, you don't have what's called in most states major ballot uh, status, major party status. You have to, it's harder to get on the ballot. And as we've seen in presidential elections, when it gets to the very end, people say, gosh, my third party vote is gonna be wasted. One of those two others is gonna win. So I better choose between the worst of two evils rather than waste my vote. Now, you know, elsewhere in the world, people have changed their systems to react to that. It is happening in this country too. Um, historically, we had more than two parties. They just sort of coalesced that way. And you're seeing now uh, various states come up with ways to broaden the choice that electors electorate has, um, often again by citizen initiative, because the legislatures are two party legislatures, they're not going to do this. So in the, again, the Western states uh, where you have citizen initiatives and an easier time to, to get new ideas in, Alaska just this last year went to a, a sort of double change they said they would have a primary election in which anyone could run. So the parties are welcome to designate their candidates, but the whole state votes in the one primary. And then the top four candidates proceed to the general election. And they, in the general election, adopted what is called ranked choice voting, uh, which some of you may have seen um, Maine has it, New York City did it, and, and uh, had some controversy over it this year uh, because they were slow in counting the votes and they hadn't done it before. The Republican um, Party of Virginia used it to select a nominee. They did. Um, so we've had very direct experience with it here. The ranked choice voting theory is you vote for your first choice. And so step back a moment, that means you can vote for your third or fourth party choice without wasting your ballot because you vote for your first choice and then you designate your second choice and your third choice on those ballots. Uh, so that if your first choice is not in the top two, your vote, your second choice is now your vote. So it is moving your vote from the person who isn't going to be in the final group to one of the people who is. Uh, Maine did that because it had had a series of elections where the <laughs> demonstrably least popular person won because basically up there what happened was you had a very conservative Republican and then you had a Democrat and an independent who was a moderate and the Democrat and the independent between them got almost two thirds of the vote and the Republican got 34, 35% and was governor. And so the majority of the state thought, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense because that person doesn't represent the majority of us. And so they had a very real example in front of them and they went to ranked choice voting. The theory is that it makes it le elections less polarizing because if you are looking for people's second votes, you actually would like them to like you. So it doesn't become a base election where you just turn out your people because otherwise the risk is that the people who were turned off by whether it's left or right, your hardline stances uh, won't make you their second choice. And so you might get 35%, 36% and be ahead in the four-way race, but you won't gain any votes after that. So that's one way in which uh, states are experimenting uh, with alternatives to the traditional uh, two-party system. Each party runs its own primaries. They produce candidates. They run in the general election. And then what's called first past the post, 
whichever one gets more votes than the other, even if not a majority wins. Of course, in, the, in, the, in some of the Southern states, you see these runoff elections where if you, no one gets more than 50.0%, the top two then, then run off. So there are a variety of ways to deal with that, but the underlying dynamic, which goes back to the, the Virginia Republican nomination this year, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, so th there were two aspects of that. One, I thought, laudable and one less so. In fact, not. Um, there's been a fight in states across the country and in this state, really, in the Republican Party about do we want to be an open or a closed party? Um, and open parties in Virginia mean you have a primary election because, as you know, we don't actually register by party. Uh, we're uh, very unusual in that. So people say I'm a Republican or a Democrat, but you're actually just a registered Virginia voter. So anyone can go and vote in any party primary. That's a great thing for independents who otherwise get excluded because they can choose to affiliate with one party or the other and vote in, in that primary. So that's been the open approach. Uh, the Virginia Republican Party increasingly has not liked that uh, because the core of the party who elect the state central committee, which makes the decisions on this, or some of the party, uh, the county parties, have said, wait a minute, we only want our people in those elections. We don't want all those other people, uh, certainly not those independents who aren't true blue loyal Republicans. So then they move to a canvas or a caucus or a so-called firehouse primary, all of which means um, you don't get a ballot on primary day. Instead, you have to actually go to a meeting or a place and spend hours there, often not anywhere near you, in order to vote. So the effect of that is the hardcore turns out, and they tend to elect more extreme candidates. So for the Republican Party in Virginia this year decided to do an exclusionary process. So uh, I, you and I couldn't just have gone and voted. You had to work your way through the system and get selected by local bodies and so forth. So I think that was not the right model. On the other hand, what they did, um, largely because of COVID and their inability to meet in one big room, is adopt a system where you could go to different places in the state in that group if you were one of those delegates and vote. And they chose a rank choice system. Uh, which had the effect that, that commentators often predict of the more extreme candidates not getting the second and third and fourth uh, choices as it went through those rounds. So that Youngkin, who ended up winning, probably would not have won if it was a first-past-the-post system. He did not start with uh, enough support and, and build enough uh, that you would think that would happen, except for this rank choice system. Uh, so it's an interesting e example of, of a state party doing that. And, and it's particularly interesting because in most of these other states, it has been Democrats who have supported rank choice and Republicans, as in Maine, um, disliking it uh, because they thought somehow um, it disadvantaged Republicans. And yet here you have the Republicans using it. And I think from all signs, being pleased with the way that process worked. A lot of us evaluate the, the intensity of the participation as a sign of whether or not people believe in the elections, basically the rate of voter participation. Um, in some states, there's efforts to limit who can participate, you know, to, you know make tighter voter registration rules and voting rules. Others are trying to accommodate, you know, having extended periods for um, open open voting, early voting, other other things that have come up, drop off boxes, all those things. But the the test is: are people participating? Um, any thoughts on that? Sort of as as the arc of history has gone on, it seems like more and more people can participate. But are we getting the level of of civic engagement that we need to have the sort of the moral authority of government uh, be tied to that sense of, of everyone gets to be part of the system? Great question. Our, you know, our numbers uh, in 2020 were both in, in absolute numbers 
uh, and um, in, in percentages of the eligible voters were historically high. Uh, so that was, was great news for, for people who worry that there's citizen apathy. Of course, there wasn't apathy. You had uh, two sides that um, were pretty much terrified of each other and ginning up their vote. Uh, so you had a lot of people uh, out there uh, voting. The, uh, I mean, the, there are political scientists who, having bemoaned the low levels of participation in some years, you know, then point out, well, we're now so polarized. Everyone is so energized. That's why they're voting. Uh, and then I think it is true that that uh, happy, contented people are less likely to vote uh, unless they see a threat. Uh, to their world from the other side, uh, or they are angry enough at what's happening, they want to make a, a change. Um, that's, that's just a, a characteristic, unless you're going to be like Australia and fine people for not voting, uh, you are going to have some people who you know, just won't vote. Um, and there are people who uh, do not get involved in the process. That's one reason I think it's so important to have young people uh, as they're going through high school, not only have a civics class and understand it, but then get pre-registered to vote so that when they turn 18, they can, because most of the studies show that voting habits stick with you for life. So if you have children or grandchildren who are voting when they're 18, they are much more likely to vote uh, when it's harder to do so. And, and what tends to happen is uh, kids are going to off to college, and that's a whole different setting. They may not be registered in their college town. Uh, it may not be easy to get registered in their college town. There may be questions about whether they're actually a resident of that state. On the other hand, it's not easy to vote at home because they're not there. Uh, and so they have to get an absentee ballot and, and do that through the mail and send it back. And those are not simple. So what happens is that you see a real fall off among young people because they're in college, because they're moving around, uh, and then they've lost the habit. And so when they eventually are settled down, some of them will start voting again and paying attention to school boards and taxes and roads and all the things that are in our lives, but, but some of them just will never get back into to that habit. So on, on the one hand, I think we need to be really conscious that we promote voting for younger people so that it is something they do through their lifetime. Beyond that, though, I think your question correctly indicates there is a real dispute going on. Do we want to make it easy to vote or hard to vote? And, and I have known people over my political career who believed, you know, in a very deeply philosophical basis that voting is a privilege, it's not a right. Um, and it can be taken away and it shouldn't be easy because if it's easy, then people will vote who uh, are so-called casual voters and, and may not you know, be as passionate about it as others. Personally, I think that that is a mistake as a matter of, of policy because voters tend to feel invested in the system and they feel they are playing a role. Uh, they feel the government is accountable to them. Uh, when you see you know, swing elections, what's happened is voters have said, we don't like the results of what we did, so we're gonna undo it. And I think that's important that people feel they have a stake in their community and, and in their country. And, and a real way to do that is through voting uh, particularly in wave elections where you're joining a group of people who believe passionately that they want to change something that's happening. Um, now, the, where does, where does what happened in Texas fit in that, in that spectrum? Is that a, is that a legislature saying we need to be more careful who can participate or are they simply just dealing with the process itself and, and not so much who's registered, but how we vote and make sure that there's so it's interesting because Virginia and Texas are just about at opposite ends of the spectrum uh, in terms of making it possible for people to vote. Um, and, and, you know, they're not 
otherwise at the absolute opposite ends of spectrums. Uh, but Texas make is makes it more difficult than any other state in the country to vote, and they just made it more difficult than it was before. Even in COVID, they refused to let citizens have absentee ballots uh, unless they were out of the state, literally on their sick bed with a note from a doctor, um, or over 65. So that was a privileged group of the population seen as more Republican. And, and I think it's fair to say in Texas that that Republican legislature believes uh, that they would like fewer rather than more voters. They got there with the voters that are there now, and they're not keen to see waves of new voters. And so in Texas in this last year, when major cities made it easier for their residents to vote, with things like drive-by voting where you didn't have to get out and go into a crowded co uh, polling place because of COVID, but also drive-by is actually more convenient or keeping the places open later uh, so that people can get off work and vote, those sorts of things. Um, the legislature didn't like that and has taken specifically prohibited uh, localities from doing things like that that make it easier, which is exactly what the Georgia legislature did. Whereas Virginia um, has made it really quite easy to register, easy to vote in person, early, absentee, um, the, the voting places that, that will exist around the state to vote in this election. Um, the, the legislature has decided that it is better uh, to have more people than fewer people vote. And before you conclude that that is clearly a Democratic legislature versus a Republican, you know, one of the interesting things about the Trump movement, and, and I think one of the things that makes this attack on absentee balloting so difficult to understand, is that Trump was elected in 16 and almost reelected in 20 by people who don't normally vote. He brought out people who are not normal Republican voters. Uh, I, I have a, a, a great friend who was one of John McCain's top strategists who explained to me, and unfortunately a whole group of my friends before the 2016 election, how clear it was that Trump could never win. And the reason was because if you looked at all the data from the 2008, 12, and 16, and eight and 12 elections with Romney and McCain, uh, there weren't enough votes there. Trump had clearly turned off some Republican women, he turned off some minorities, and there wasn't any way to make that up. Well, Trump made it up with new voters who came out uh, because they, they really wanted a change election. And then in 2020, both sides motivated their voters and got them out. Uh, so you saw, that's why you saw these record turnouts. So to me, it's not at all clear that one party or the other has an advantage by making it easier uh, to vote. These attacks on absentee balloting, and you know, Arizona has a, um, uh, an evergreen system where if you ask for a ballot absentee, you get it in all of the subsequent elections absentee unless you tell them to stop. And there was a big push to change that so that you'd have to apply every year. And my friends in the Republican world said, why are they doing this? It's us Republicans who are voting absentee in Arizona. The Republicans have had an advantage for years because Arizona has a very large elderly population and they might not vote if they're not feeling well or if it's raining or if it's really hot in the August elections and they're in San Diego as John McCain always used to joke that his, his voters were all in San Diego in August, which is when they hold the primary. Uh, so the absentee balloting is what made the difference. And yet, you know, that's something that, that has been attacked in a, in a number of these states. So we've talked a lot about partisanship, um, a little bit about making sure that minorities are, are not eliminated from meaningful representation. In Virginia, that's taken on sort of an interesting twist. Uh, in the redistricting that's being contemplated, there's a question of whether existing black elected officials will, will suffer from a from spreading of black voters amongst other districts to strengthen the Democratic Party's chances overall. Is that something that you have, have looked at before? Is that a, is that a, 
a real concern. So it's a very live issue um, and it has a history. Uh, the Republican Party nationally figured out in the 1980s that the way they could gain congressional seats uh, and state legislative seats was to make common cause with the minority communities in Southern states and work with um, black legislative leaders so that their seats were secure by putting in lots of black voters. So they were happy because they got reelected easily. The problem is those voters therefore were not in the surrounding districts which were therefore less democratic and the Republicans could win those seats. Uh, it, it, is, it is known as packing districts. Uh, and uh, that would be subject to a, a challenge uh, under the Voting Rights Act that you are minimizing minority representation by putting them all in one district. That's, I mean, the basic concept of gerrymandering itself is you, you, know, you put all of the other party in as few districts as possible and make them 100% for that party, and then you get the rest, which is a majority. And so that's exactly that same dynamic plays out here, um, where you would not want, and it would in fact, I think violate, it would violate the Voting Rights Act to spread out minority voters so that they could not elect their own representatives in districts. Um, that would get you back to that, what we discussed is a sort of at-large problem where you'd have, you know, whatever it is, 25 or 30% of the state unable to elect any of their community. But you can go the other way and put them all in one district. So there's a balance here. And that's the, uh, it's something the Republicans took advantage of for years in the South, uh, drawing these lines with the support of, of um, some black legislators to make them safe but end up losing the Democratic majority in the legislature. And so that's certainly a, a piece, a complicated piece of the uh, Virginia calculation of, of how much is enough to be safe. Uh, and remember that, that there's nothing about either the Voting Rights Act or One Man, One Vote that says that you have to keep the existing uh, minority members of the legislature. Um, you just have to make sure that you don't diminish the chance of minority groups to elect their favored candidate who might not be the incumbent. Um, uh, so that's, and, and of course, that's one reason you have an independent commission is that incumbents have a very direct interest in making sure they get reelected. So when legislatures draw those lines, you can be darn sure that the majority doesn't put any of their incumbents at risk. So all this is very sobering, right? Because you see, it's a it's a complex, multivariable calculation, and that 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 tends to make people a little nervous. I think just just naturally. Back in 2016, you gave an address at, at Chautauqua on the Fourth of July and said that there was a quote in there that. 59% of Americans agree with the statement that the political system is broken. We just need to start over. Um, so that's one point of view. Um, the other point of view is we just need to be more engaged and we need to participate. In an ideal world, is there a way to get to focus on issues and less on, on partisanship and less on you know, philosophy and more on outcomes? For conservationists, that often seems like 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 the problem. We, you know, we, we should be able to agree on, you know, what what is good for the environment and, and how to accomplish that. Is there any which which direction are we going? We're we going to go for more partisanship and polarization, or or is there a chance for finding common ground? So, I mean, there's that great line by Winston Churchill that democracy is the worst form of government ever invented, except all others. Uh, it's not perfect, and it's never. It's it's not going to be perfect. I think ours is over the last two hundred years, as I've said, moved in the right direction. Uh, it has more participation. People feel uh, more that that they have a say and they are uh, a stake in the the system. Uh, so 
in that sense, I, I think we have moved the right way. There's still lots of things we can do as we've discussed tonight. There are all sorts of different ideas that we could learn from other countries and see what works and what doesn't and experiment with some of these systems. Um, I think that one of the problems with polarization is that you tend to end up voting for your tribe, your R or your D, without regard really to what the policies are. And at the national level, uh, we know generally, not, not always, what, what the parties stand for. Um, with, with Trump, I think a lot of that got scrambled and it's still being, you know, we're looking at it, trying to figure it out. But um, at the local level, and this is something you mentioned earlier, I didn't really have a chance to address. I, I think this is a bigger problem because local issues are often very disconnected from national uh, policy, whether it is you know, schools or land use uh, or you know, county expenditures, um, environmental uh, policies, recycling, whatever it is, those do not fall on, on party lines. But if you have an electorate that is programmed to vote for the R or the D, particularly an electorate that doesn't really know uh, much about these individuals, because that gets to the, we have a lot of elections and um, not everyone is going to be all that engaged. So they, they take the party label as a signal of what they should be doing. Hold on one second. I'm going to get rid of the uh, puppy who's turned up. Out of here. Out. The electoral process has gone to the dogs, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the puppy who's just come back from the trainer where he's supposed to have learned to be calmer. So sorry about that. The joys of home Zoom. Um, so I, I think the, the problem we have is that those issues don't line up very neatly with party lines. And yet, uh, particularly in er I mean, uh, areas that have become much more suburban uh, tend to have more transient voters who are, are, didn't go to school in that locality or county have moved in from somewhere else, don't know a lot about the local issues, uh, the, the uh, dearth of reporting uh, of local papers dying uh, means they may not have good sources to know what's happening. Uh, all of that means they're looking for some other indicator and it may become the R or the D on the ballot, uh, which is really unfortunate. Virginia's had a tradition of independent candidates, particularly at the local level, on the theory that these shouldn't be party races. And so you had individuals running as individuals. That's still happening, but it is rarer than it, it used to be. Uh, and so I think for, for those of us who are focused on, on local issues and, and on conservation, it becomes really important to educate the electorate so that they're not just relying on the, the party label. So at the end of the day, and, and we're coming up on 7.30, um, and so I want to be respectful of people's time, and we've taken, I've fed, I've fed in some questions from the audience, so, so hopefully people, if you have further questions, please, please chat them, and, and we'll, we'll try to try to follow up. Um, end of the day, you know, what's a good citizen to do? Do we, first of all, I, I hope they'll support the, the Center for, for Campaign Campaign Legal Center. The Campaign Legal Center. TLC. And your work, um, you, you're doing amazing breadth of things and, and, and across the country and at every level of government. And, and I, for one, am deeply appreciative of that. Um, but you know, you know what, what would you say to the average citizen? Where should they start? Where should they put their time in? What, what's the most important thing to, to do? You know, I, I think it's so important in, in this day where we have, we're bombarded with information and there's all the different, you know, silos on the internet and everything else um, to be involved locally. And, uh, you know, many of us do that. Uh, everyone on this call does it through the PEC, which is a local organization of only a set of counties in, in Virginia, a big and important area of the Piedmont, but still, you know, we get information from the PEC, which we can trust and that helps us understand what's happening in the state and, and in our localities. There are other local groups uh, that, that do that as well. Most communities have several 
uh, groups, whether they're conservation groups or uh, garden clubs or um, organizations focusing on tax issues. Uh, all of that, I think, is, is a good way for, for people to get involved and understand the, who the local candidates are, uh, give them money. We operate in a campaign finance system. We haven't really talked about that. Virginia on that one is the outlier. It's one of only five states with no limits at all on sources or amounts of, of contributions. So candidates need money to run. Uh, raise it, give it, introduce candidates to your neighbors. Um, and all the sort of Tocquevillian stuff becomes more important at the, the local level uh, because one or two people really can make a difference. Um, you know, if you're, if, if you're on this call, you are a thoughtful person and you're probably a leader in your community. So letting your friends and neighbors know who you're supporting, holding a meet and greet where the candidate for sheriff can come and meet people he wouldn't meet otherwise. Uh, all of those things really reach out. They, they have significant ripples. Um, you know, voting for president is important, but you, you are one of you know, hundreds of millions doing that. Uh, local elections get decided by a lot less. There was a Virginia House of Delegates race uh, won by a Virginia law school classmate of mine uh, by 46 votes last time. Uh, so oh, coin flip, right? it, it, may, it makes a difference. Yeah. So a so couple of observations from the audience. So, you know, the, you know asking about the 70% plus participation in the last presidential cycle in Virginia, you know, what, what do we attribute that to? But also the, the other side, which is the, the divide that we see in, in the election between urban and rural communities in the state, you know. Any, any observations on that? You know, how do we bridge those, those very real um, divides that are showing up in, in the data? We have a lot of participation, but all it's showing is stark division. It is showing stark division. I, I think it's your job, Chris, at the PEC, how to bridge some of those divides, because they're, they're really important ones. Um, the, you know, the sociologists will say that these divides come because the, we don't know the other. Um, the, you know, the rural areas get uh, characterized by uh, urbanites as, as all uh, yahoos, and the uh, rural people think the, uh, they don't know any urban people, and, and they don't, you know, they don't know what they're like, and they don't like them. Uh, so the more that we get to know each other in our communities, the better off we, we are clearly going to be, and I think the PEC does uh, really good educational work trying to bridge that uh, partisan divide in, in the area of conservation, which is an important way to do it. Well, thank you so much for, for your insights and thank you for your participation, uh, folks on the call. And, and we'll again recorded this, so we'll, we'll get it back out to a much broader list. Um, Virginia is place where I grew up and place where I do my, my professional work. I'm, I'm always learning new things and I learned a lot tonight. Um, I think that's part of both the, the good and the bad of elections is that it's, it's a very complex and evolving area. And we need to, to dig deep into it so that we trust the, the officials that we give great authority to as they take on big issues and, and help us try to try to uh, make the world a better place. And I think uh, I'd like to end with, with that thought that when, as we go into this, this next election cycle, uh, we really do need to appeal to a greater good uh, and be considerate of each other and, and our points of view so that we have some chance of, of dealing with real challenges that we face, whatever, whatever one you wanna pick, whether it's uh, climate change and increased flooding or the need for a uh, sustainable food system that, that feeds all of us, um, or it's the, the difficult issue of what to protect and, and what to develop. Um, all of these things need common cause, and I hope that um, we, we can respect each other as we go forward. Thank you, Trevor, for, for all that you do, and thanks, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Chris, so much. Yeah. Marco, any last notes? I think that was great. Thank you. And if you have any <clears throat> other questions, don't hesitate to, to reach out via email, pass them along to, to Chris and, and Trevor. And uh, thanks again, Trevor. And thank, 
thank you for for joining us, everyone. And, and with that, we'll uh, we'll and sign. Mark, off. Marco, one last word, yeah. which is uh, just to get it straight: it's Campaign Legal Center, right? Uh, and it has a website. And take a look at the work we're doing. Uh, you'll find much more discussion on a number of these issues. When, when we send out the recording, we'll we'll include links to to the Campaign Legal Center and. Uh, we, we will make sure that folks know how to get in touch with you directly. So 